discussion of post-2014 Afghanistan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I just would like to ask you to stand for the presenting of the national colors. I'd like to thank Army RPC at Utah Valley University for, the, for providing the, the class. Well, this event is a culmination of the established tradition at Utah Valley University to host national and foreign dignitaries at UVU through student efforts as an example of true engaged learning approach. On behalf of Utah International Mountain Forum, which is a coalition of student clubs at UVU, I wish to extend a special greeting and uh, sincere appreciation for coming to UVU to our guest, Dr. Roger Tengas, who is incidentally our speaker this morning. Please let us welcome Dr. Tengas by giving him a round. <laughs> Dr. Tengas has come from, uh, to us from Washington, D.C. to make a four-day visit to the state of Utah, three days of which he has spent at Utah Valley University meeting with various students members of the faculty and administration, delivering presentations and participating in other activities on UVU campus. Dr. Kingis, it is our pleasure and privilege to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Likewise, I would like to extend gratitude to the Office of Engaged Learning, Office of International Affairs and Diplomacy, History and Political Science Department, the Center for Constitutional Studies, and Army ROTC at UVU for their considerable contribution to the success of Dr. Tengis' visit to UVU. And finally, I would like to give many thanks to my dear colleagues from the Youth International Mountain Forum, who represent, by the way, various UVU clubs, such as the Alexander Hamilton Society, Sustainable Mountain Development, Foreign Affairs Clubs, and many other organizations at UVU campus. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time I would like to ask Christopher Lucy, the president of Sustainable Mountain Development Club, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Dr. Roger Kangas is the academic dean and a professor of Central Asian Studies at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Previously, Dr. Kangas served as a professor of Central Asian Studies at the George C. Marshall Center for European Security in Garmisch, Partenkirchen, Germany. He likewise was the deputy director of the Central Asian Institute at the Paul H. Neitz School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C. Central Asian Course Coordinator at the Foreign Service Institute for the U.S. Department of State, Research Analyst, an analyst on Central Asian Affairs for the Open Media <coughs> Research Institute in Prague, Czech Republic, and an Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Mississippi. In addition to this, Dr. Kangas has been an advisor to the Combatant Command's NATO International Security Assistance Force, the United States Air Force Special Operations School, National Democratic Institute, International Research and Exchanges Board, 
American Council's Academy for Educational Development, United States Information Agency, United States Agency for International Development, and other United States government agencies on issues relating to Central and South Asia, Russia, and the South Caucasus. He is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Dr. Congas holds a Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service and Comparative Politics from the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and a PhD in Political Science from Indiana University. I've had the privilege of spending the past few days with Dr. Congas and I've learned a great deal and I'm sure you will too. Um, please welcome Dr. Congas. Thing, of course, that happened was by 
by November of that year, that is literally one month later, a month and a half later, uh, the Taliban started falling. City after city fell. By December, um, the country was actually rid of the Taliban in Al Qaeda. They had fled into the easternmost provinces of the country and more specifically into Pakistan. Now, speaking not just even to American audiences, but particularly to international audiences, that was that question of you know, how many troops were there at the time? And it's an easy number to remember because it's the exact same number of people we had in Congress, 535 uh, American troops and intelligence officers from the CIA and other agencies were present. That was it. Uh, it wasn't until December when the 10th Mountain comes in that we actually see the numbers now get into the several thousands that was it. So, you know, a fairly low footprint, a small presence, and of course, as many of you know, if you study international affairs and U.S. security policy, um, we quickly turned our attention to another phenomenon, this thing called Iraq, and by March of 2003, we really were vested in that campaign. <coughs> Afghanistan was often called the Forgotten War, the Unknown War, you know, the Mama War, as opposed to the Daddy War in Iraq, you know, all sorts of cute phrases were used, but the reality uh, was far less uh, positive. Um, our activity in the region was one of maintenance, not really expansion and building. And so we moved to this current era of surges, and, and finally the October, uh, sorry, the December uh, 2011 announcement of President Obama that suggested we would be withdrawing from Afghanistan. Um, we see what we would often call the end game. Now, we can spend a lot of time, and I'd be happy to do this, to go over what was our intention, what were our goals, what was the policy in the region. All I have to say is during this time frame, 2001 to 2014, if there's an easy way to consider it, it's, it was an era of multiple missions, an era of changing missions, an era of changing forces, changing resources, and different nations engaged in Afghanistan. Uh, and it wasn't just the US kept changing its policy. France changed its policy, Germany changed its policy, the Netherlands, Canada, the United Kingdom, um, Afghanistan itself, the neighboring states, Pakistan, China, uh, up north, Russia, uh, we all kept reevaluating Afghanistan during this time. And so it makes the discussion of Afghanistan today extremely difficult. And that's you know, sort of have, have a takeaway, sort of the bottom line up front. It's when we try to analyze what's next, the hardest thing to think about, of course, is well, what exactly did we do? What were we doing? And what got us to this point? Uh, so we can better understand you know, this neighborhood, this country. Now, I, you'll see very quickly, and there's a lot of slides. Um, it's, I think, a curse now of spending too much time with the Defense Department. We are incapable of speaking without pictures behind us. And so, um, you know, we have to manage slide presentations. And, and so uh, you'll see this, but there's also a personal uh, attachment I have to maps. I think maps help us <coughs> explain, understand, uh, and really uh, sort of come to terms with the particular region, especially a region that maybe isn't familiar to us. Uh, you know, even here as, a, as an East Coast guy uh, coming to Utah, you know, I'm actually uh, uh, fascinated by, you know, if you want to say the geography of the American West, I mean, I'll be blunt, we Easterners don't really know what happens here. And I'm speaking actually as a native Midwestern, as a Chicagoan. Um, but what happens in this country in the proximity of Utah to its neighboring states helps explain you know, economics in the region, helps explain uh, transportation, you name it. Uh, same thing is going to apply here, uh, a, a sort of vast landlocked region um, with an interesting neighborhood. Now, a, a little uh, a sort of postscript or note to this map, particular map, uh, it's actually from the National Geographic Society. And they, it was one that was they, they introduced in 1992, maybe early 93, but I think it was 92. Uh, and it was basically a way to explain the post-Soviet space, Central Asia, as you heard from the introduction, I had a, a keen interest in Central Asia, but it was a way to look at Central Asia outside of the Soviet order, outside of the Russian order. And it said, you know, we continually cap Central Asia in a Russian view, let's look at it in this other view. And so, imagine 1992, this is before the Iraq War, before Afghanistan, before problems with Pakistan, et cetera, some folks at the National Geographic Society said, hey, this is an interesting way to look at Afghanistan and its neighbors, Central Asia. And I would contend in 2014, this map is actually a good way to start. 
discussion because it shows that Afghanistan really is this regional actor, this regional player that has to contend with a dynamic of Pakistan. It has to address this 900 kilometer border with Iran. Even if the United States doesn't talk to Iran, they do, other countries do, but even states to the north, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, these countries have specific bilateral ties with Afghanistan and have to factor in uh, the future of this country. And yes, one last little border, if you take the Wakhan corridor here, this little stretch of land, um, beautiful valley, by the way, um, it takes you right to the Chinese border. Um, again, a small little historic uh, footnote, that Wakhan corridor was actually purposely placed by both the Russians and the British. They didn't want their competing empires to touch. And so they said, you know, the best way to have peace in the region is to just give this to Afghanistan, which was deemed a neutral state at the time. And so that little corridor actually is going to play a role in Afghan history from you know, over the last decade. But you know, if we look at this in terms of Afghanistan and its neighbors, and my intent is really to say, let's not think of it in terms of some great game. Um, this, of course, is from a British magazine, Punch, which has our British lion and Russian bear fighting over the Afghan emir, and he says, save me from my friends. Uh, sometimes our Afghan colleagues feel this way, that we great outside powers are busy trying to figure out how to manage them. But rather, let's look at it in terms of its linkages with other states. This mythical 2014 or magical 2014 is really about transportation links. It's really about engaging Afghanistan with its neighbors. Now, we think of an old Silk Road, and Afghanistan played a part in that, as did Central Asia, Iran, or we would call it Persia. Um, you know, China and all that. Um, but there's a new Silk Road, um, and one which is already in place. Now this is not from the National Geographic Society, this was actually from uh, the CIA. This was a classified map until somebody at the Washington Post got it, published it, and <laughs> then I think they realized everyone has it now. Um, and it's used as bird cage lining, so let's make it public. Uh, and it's actually much more sophisticated than this today, but uh, wh what I see in this map are a couple of stories. Um, one, it actually explains how we are engaging in Afghanistan, and I will tell you that from a logistical point of view, this is quite impressive. Uh, from a military point of view, this is quite impressive. Um, in 1999, I was involved in an interagency exercise where we were looking at a situation where, you know, could U.S. troops ever be placed in Central Asia, or the Caspian region specifically we're looking at? You know, would there ever be a situation where the U.S. would send troops to the area? And you know, we created all these scenarios. I got to play the president of Iran, that was fun. Um, also had a stint as the president of Kazakhstan. And we tried all sorts of interesting game exercises. We had terrorist groups, we had things going on, all sorts of problems. And every time the Defense Department came back to us and Nope, you know, hostages taken. You know, we're not going to send troops to them because, of course, this place is too far away. It's strategically unimportant. There are no good neighbors. There are no good bases. Logistically, a nightmare. Why would we ever send troops to this part of the world? Well, of course, the story I started with: October or September 2001, and then October 2001 with the military mission changes that. We found a reason to go to the region, and over time. This has developed, and this is basically how we've supplied and supported uh, our operations in Afghanistan. You see the transportation links from Pakistan <coughs> inward. You see air routes coming from the Gulf countries, sea routes, you know, going up to Karachi and onward. You see these little X's, and especially those of you with good vision, uh, on the Pakistan-Afghan border. On occasion, these get shut down if there are drone attacks in Pakistan and the Pakistani government is not happy with them, they'll shut the border, block transportation in the region. As a result, we thought, hey, let's create a different kind of strategy, let's create a different approach, and start bringing in through things through the north, what's called the Northern Distribution Network. This NDN, this Northern Distribution Network, was really supposed to be just two trains a week, you know, small uh, contingent, five, 10 percent of supplies going in, that's it. We do have a transit center at Manas, and there's a, a, a reroute center through Navoi in Uzbekistan. Um, and again, these are going to play a role, and a, a functional role for the region. But what's happened over time, particularly as the Pakistani routes uh, became so problematic, 
the decision was to emphasize the northern routes. And you see this really string of, of routes that go from the Baltic states through Russia. We have routes going through the Caucasus, um, you know, all over the place. This has actually developed over the last, let's say, four or five years. Uh, so quite impressive uh, in terms of our activity. Now, what's happening uh, today, I should say, is when we look at our, po our view of post-2014, that is the official US view, it's this military supply route is going to transform into a great Silk Road, modern Silk Road, the new Silk Road. It will somehow be an integrated transportation economic structure embedding Afghanistan with its neighbors. Not at our cost. It's going to be local cost, local expenses, local businesses. Now, there are some American firms playing the role, transportation companies, uh, um, you know, uh, trucking companies, uh, road construction firms, etc. But we have uh, Chinese and Iranian and Pakistani uh, other firms in there, Asian Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank, etc. are all playing the role. And the idea, at least, and it's a, an optimistic idea, is that this will somehow keep Afghanistan tied with the rest of the world so they're not going to devolve into some you know, chaotic realm. Now, again, as we've been reading the news and watching the news over the last few days, even, we see that so much of this is contingent upon our presence. And in fact, this was always contingent upon a small force of Western forces, US, European, but I would say others as well. The Australians play a role. Um, the, 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 the possibility of having militaries from South Asia, Southeast Asia in the region, um, you know, all have come into play here. Uh, this is all up in the air, so the question is, does this really hold water? And the conversation in Washington is always, well, is this new Silk Road really just a Silk Green and is it gonna vanish? And will we see Afghanistan sort of become an isolated entity uh, collapsing? This is the challenge facing us. Now I'm gonna offer some other alternatives. And what we have here, and you know, to be honest, is a series of states, a series of countries that each have their own interests. And you know, mindful of the clock there, I'm glad you guys have a clock in the room because I could actually go on for about eight hours and just keep going and going. I'm not, because I want to get this into a, a discussion and conversation. But I want to highlight a few points of some neighboring countries just to get us thinking about how others are viewing this and how this future for Afghanistan, this 2014 for Afghanistan, um, might be different. Uh, one of these, of course, is Pakistan itself. Um, now, when we think of it, of course, Pakistan has its own security interests. Um, would they like to control Afghanistan? There is that discussion, of course. Uh, sort of an elder brother, younger brother relationship. They see Afghanistan as uh, their strategic depth. You see this in that second point, uh, the Indian dilemma. They actually look at Afghanistan as the dual's relationship with India. Uh, if India were to ever attack Pakistan, which for the cold star policy that India has, um, Pakistanis believe that they may need strategic depth to include uh, Afghanistan to help survive as a nation. And you think in terms of large countries can provide that. You know, Russia is the greatest example of this. But other states want to have this quality. Pakistan feels it needs Afghanistan to play this part. So there is this interesting notion that, that Afghanistan has a, a, a role to play in Pakistan's own internal stability and security. Now, if it were just that, we'd say, okay, get it. If you're a good realist, you know, realpolitik, uh, you can understand that clear as day. But now we have this other issue. You have elements within the Pakistani government who supported the insurgency. Um, the Taliban was created on Pakistani soil. It was funded by members of the ISI. Um, there's a Pakistani author by the name of Ahmad Rashid who has done uh, excellent work describing the Taliban and describing its origins. I would strongly recommend looking him up. Uh, as well as a writer by the name of Steve Cole, C-O-L-L. -L. Uh, his book, Ghost Wars. Um, and I would almost say it's great beach reading, which you're like, wait a second. It's a book about the intelligence services of Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. He's just a great storyteller. He has great words. And, and so it's an engaging drama. And he looks at the intelligence services and how they provided support for groups such as the Mujahideen and other opposition forces, the role that people such as Osama bin Laden played in this. I mean, objectively speaking, uh, what role did they play in this anti-Soviet campaign? What role did they play in the development of extremist organizations in Pakistan and in Afghanistan? And in many ways, how we missed the boat or 
how we didn't understand the dynamics or simply how it didn't pass us by. But it's the, a lot of these signs were in place and what we see is actually a pretty prominent role played by the Pakistani intelligence forces, the Pakistani government. This is a contentious issue within Pakistan itself. What role did they play? And you know, perhaps the greatest uh, uh, sort of little uh, vignette on this, of course, was the death of Osama bin Laden. He was housed in Abbottabad or within the boundaries of Pakistan. He had been staying there and hosted there for several years, if not more, um, much to the dismay, disappointment, or embarrassment of the Pakistani government, particularly the military. Uh, the fact that uh, this operation happened without Pakistani knowledge was itself embarrassing. Uh, the fact that he was discovered there was also problematic. And this has actually strained U.S.-Pakistani relations. But there are other tensions at play here as well. And it's, it's the simple ethnic part. Now, this often gets overplayed in geopolitical discussions of Afghanistan. Ah, cross-border Pushkin groups. Now, before we think that there's great Pushkin unanimity, there is not. Uh, different tribal groups, different clan groups, different organizations among the Pushkin have just as easy time fighting each other as they do fighting outsiders. It's often when they have an outside threat that they may unify. But we see this as a problem both within Pakistan and within Afghanistan. Um, there was a Pakistani colonel once noted uh, that he said, you know, we will not succeed unless Afghanistan succeeds, and Afghanistan will not succeed unless we succeed. And what he was referring to were the insurgencies in their respective countries. The problem is these insurgencies are also supported by people in these countries. And so we have with this probably the most complicated border and the one that we spend a lot of time focusing on, but there are others. Um, Iran. Now in the United States, I know Iran is not thought of well. Uh, you know, we still have this image of 1979. Um, you know, we all saw Argo, we know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, and these images are real. Uh, you know, it's not uh, um, uh, some sort of, you know, made up uh, uh, animosity. In fact, I, I argue that it's, it's one of the most complicated emotional foreign policies we have in the United States, perhaps the other one being Cuba, where people can't think rationally in terms of engaging or not engaging with this country because we still remember certain acts, even in that case, decades or later. Uh, in the sense of the um, Iran, uh, U.S. Iranian relation, um, I, I would actually recommend a gentleman by the name of Mark Bowden, uh, B-O-W-D-E-N, uh, wrote this wonderful book called Guests of the Ayatollah, and it's a history of the hostages. Uh, for those of you who remember the hostages, of course, it'll bring back a lot of memories of, oh, wow, that was pretty wild. For those of you who don't, or who didn't remember this, because obviously it was a few years before you were around, um, it's a great story. Uh, and it's actually a great story of heroism. You had um, men and women held hostage for uh, uh, quite a long period of time. The longest were held for 444 days. And what were their coping techniques? What were their strategies? Uh, the Marine Guards who taunted their, uh, the Marine Guards who were held hostage, who taunted their Iranian Guards knowing that every day they'd get beaten up, but at least they felt they had little victories with them. Um, you know, it was, uh, again, there, there's uh, a lot of good stories in that, but these are the sorts of things we still remember. These hostages are alive. Uh, one of them is actually a colleague of mine. And, uh, um, you know, so we think of this and it shapes how we view Iran. But in the region, Iran is looked at differently. It's looked at a trade and energy partner. Um, is there a sense of fomenting unrest? This gets weird because Iranians both support Karzai and they also have been funneling money to the Taliban. They riddle me this. Why would they do it? Eh, maybe hedging their bets, maybe just making things complicated, and maybe it's let's support Karzai and let's help Americans die. I hate to sound a little caustic on that, but that is a possibility. Um, are they a regional power? This is something they definitely would like, but because this relationship with the U.S. and the nuclear issues in particular has dominated their presence, not just with respect to Afghanistan, but in the broader neighborhood, um, it has limited their engagement. Uh, they see, in fact, you know, the countries to the east of them, Afghanistan and Pakistan, as both being critical uh, and understand that this policy, this engagement, um, is, is one that they need to uh, there's one organization that actually ties these together. Uh, many of you may not know this, but it's a, an economic structure called the ECO, Economic Cooperation Organization, actually founded in 1965 um, by three staunch U.S. allies, Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan. Now again, 65 and 2014, rather 
radically different geopolitical environments. Uh, 1992, Afghanistan, the five central Asian states and Azerbaijan joined, and it was obviously a great way to unify the country, sort of an EEC, you know, European Economic Community for Southwest Asia. It's never really materialized, but this is a way in which Iran sees a future for Afghanistan uh, that is engaging in economic ties. Now we get to some of the more problematic ones, uh, Russia. And Russia's in the news a lot today because it may or may not be conducting military maneuvers along the Ukrainian border. We'll see what happens with those. Um, but to the south, they clearly have a real memory of, this, uh, of their experience in Afghanistan. On a personal note, uh, I was a student in Leningrad in 1986, and I had classmates who were drafted uh, to fight uh, in the uh, Soviet <coughs> War. Uh, several tried to get out, including one who had his friends beat him up so bad that he was hospitalized and failed his physical. Uh, to say that Soviet citizens did not know what was going on in Afghanistan uh, is a bit foolish. Uh, Soviets understood what was happening. Some supported the cause, many had concerns. Uh, again, a very mixed view of the campaign. But let's move to today. How is it viewed? And it's interesting. Uh, it's not really Vladimir Putin, but rather uh, a number of them call them the Afghansi, or these Afghan veterans, who many of whom hold key positions in government, in the security services, in business, are relooking the campaign. And you're starting to see more literature that suggests that the period 1979 to 1989 was a success. <coughs> you know, and I've even heard the phrase now from uh, retired uh, Russian generals that have said, we won the war and the politicians lost it for us. Like, wow, where have I heard that before? Uh, you know, every, uh, I think every time there's a conflict like this, people want to, you know, sort of let's blame somebody else. Um, but it's more than that. It's the image that Russia is and remains a great power. It's a regional power that plays a key role in the area, and you cannot solve Afghanistan without the presence of Russia. Um, so yes, we have this, you know, uh, view of, of Afghanistan in terms of its, its past campaign. Uh, this is the victory parade that took place on February 15th, uh, uh, 1989, when uh, uh, the last Soviet troops left Afghanistan across the Friendship Bridge. They're leaving Afghanistan, going into what we now call Uzbekistan. Um, books like Along the Goodbye, which are great reads in the sense of analyzing this, but you're seeing a reevaluation of this campaign. You're seeing even new museums being set up, um, statues, parks, um, commemorating those who died in uh, the, um, in the uh, Afghan war. In fact, even in uh, Kazakhstan, to take the neighboring state, uh, in Panfilov Park, where there's a great statue commemorating uh, Kazakh activity in the Great Patriotic War, or the Second World War, right next to it now is a new statue commemorating those Kazakhs who died in Afghanistan in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and so we're seeing this rethought. Um, but we're also seeing some modern concerns, that is, the southern flank of Russia is viewed as, its, as a security threat. Um, it's trafficking, it's terrorism. Russia, believe it or not, has a legitimate claim, a legitimate concern. They also have a concern of the presence of US and NATO forces. The notion of encirclement is key. Um, if you look at their security challenges, as I said, drug trafficking is without question a major, major concern of our Russian friends and colleagues. Um, and it makes sense. Um, in terms of drugs themselves, about 25% of Afghan drugs actually go northward. Believe it or not, most actually still go through Iran or Pakistan. Um, the northern routes, and this map even needs to be modified a bit because we see them going to Russia. Uh, it is a security problem, it's a social problem, it's a health problem in Russia. It is a drain on the economy. We're actually seeing this drug trafficking going into China now. We're seeing it go in different directions. The Gulf states, uh, phenomenal tra uh, drug trafficking routes. But in terms of security threats, the Russian government views this as the most important one. Uh, and so the solution they have is pretty simple. Collective Security Treaty Organization, a military structure that's designed, uh, sort of Russian-dominated, but includes some of the neighboring states. Could this collective defense organization help stay any threats from the South? Uh, we'll wait and see, because we'll add to them, and I've already mentioned one Central Asian state, uh, we can mention the others. Now, each has their own view of Afghanistan, and I would say the farther you're away, the less threatening it is. Uh, the Kazakh security uh, um, uh, forces don't consider Afghanistan to be an immediate threat, whereas in Uzbekistan and Tajik 
this down they do. But they all look at the transnational issues, groups like the Islamic movement in Uzbekistan, Hizbut Tahrir, drug trafficking, all concerns, but all have one last concern. Um, I would say perspective, uh, perspective instability. A failed Afghanistan is easy to figure out. And in fact, you hear this logic of, if Afghanistan fails, it's going to be a hotbed for terrorist organizations and they're going to conduct operations in our country. But recently I heard the comment of, if it's successful, that's also problematic because then terrorist groups will leave Afghanistan and go to our countries and wreak havoc. And so whether Afghanistan fails or succeeds, sometimes we see threats and concerns. Now, one issue that we periodically raise is, oh, well, they have cross-border ethnic ties. We have Turkmen and uh, Kazakhs and Uzbeks in Afghanistan. And yes, there's even a Kyrgyz community in the Wakhan corridor. So with everyone represented, uh, wouldn't we see close links? Easier said than that. Uh, it doesn't quite work that way uh, in Afghanistan. And often there are these differences north-south. So I wouldn't place it much on that. What I would emphasize, though, is on the north-south link, we see a greater activity of trade uh, development. And so, you know, this is one example. Uh, it's a bridge, or sorry, a tunnel structure in Tajikistan that is, um, uh, it was built by Iranians and by an Iranian firm. In fact, you see this is at the opening ceremony. This is when Ahmadinejad was still president. Uh, and so there's a picture of him and President Rahman. Um, it's not that President Rahman is that tall. Actually, Ahmadinejad was that short. Um, so you see the sort of disparity there. Um, I, I've, I've had the pleasure of, of going through this tunnel, and I will tell you it is one of the more life-threatening moments you're going to have. <laughs> there's, there's no electricity, there's no lights, and there's no drainage. And so what you find is it's five kilometers of darkness uh, with sort of lights strung up and flooding. Uh, and on occasion, we were going through there, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, and we're driving, driving, you know, kind of avoiding the potholes. And there's some poor <coughs> chap with a wheelbarrow kind of collecting rocks, and we almost hit him, and, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle of the tunnel. Now, what's happened today is, is two things. One, the Tajik government is suing the Iranian firm that built it uh, for, obviously, they didn't think was as good, uh, but secondly, they have a Chinese crew coming in to refurbish it. And whether we call them um, guest laborers or slave labor, you can choose the phrase. Uh, these Chinese officials, these Chinese workers who live in sort of uh, barbed wire encampments, maybe they're just for their own safety, I don't know. Uh, but it's off to the side here. They're eventually going to reconstruct that. But I highlight this because there are north-south links. Truck traffic goes through here southward into Afghanistan, northward up into Kyrgyzstan, and onward into China. We have other routes developing. Uh, this is the friendship bridge that I've shown before uh, in Termez. This is the Uzbek uh, Afghan border. Um, we have bridges in uh, crossing uh, the, the uh, Pyonj River going from Afghanistan to Tajikistan. This was actually built by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, not so bad, $37 million. And when they had the ribbon cutting ceremony, uh, the defense attaché who was representing the U.S. at the ceremony, uh, the uh, Tajik officials immediately said, this is fantastic, this is great, could you build 10 more? Um, <laughs> that can't do it. Uh, but they're actually looking at building more bridges. There's a great market that now takes place on it every Sunday, and yes, rumor has it runs across it too, but I'd like to think of the market. Uh, we have a transit center. Uh, there are north-south links in this direction. Uh, air links, obviously. This is the transit center in Kyrgyzstan, just outside of Bishkek, and it is scheduled to close this summer. Now, that's the end of the U.S. military operation and the end of the U.S. engagement. However, uh, it also suggests that it could be used for future transportation links. Now, there's some rumor that the Russians are going to take it over as soon as we leave. Uh, there's probably some truth to that, but the reality is at least some suggest it could be used as a commercial hub. And just lastly, Again, I told you lots of maps. Um, this is one that suggests um, that economic development in Afghanistan and related to Central Asia could re result or could be part of a larger electric grid. This is the Castle 1000 project, which suggests that we would have water resources in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan could actually help power uh, folks in Afghanistan and Pakistan and beyond. Uh, a larger regional energy grid using water from big water mountain rivers and streams. Uh, it's a magical resource that the uh, Kyrgyz and Tajiks have that they really need to harness and use in a regional sense. Now there's a lot of controversy about this, particularly with some downstream states like Uzbekistan, and these are the hurdles that have to be overcome. And one other issue, as long as this region is insecure, does anyone really want to invest in it? And so just kind of one last country to look at, and then I'll be happy to, to open up for
for discussion, uh, is it China? And I, you know, we can't not discuss China. Uh, and what I'd like to suggest is, is here we're looking at a work in progress. If you're in Beijing, if you're in any part of China, to be honest, you're looking at Central Asia and Afghanistan in this context. You're looking at it through Xinjiang, through the Uyghur minority you have, the Turkic minority, the Muslim minority you have out west. Now, in terms of population, it's relatively small. China is a country of 1.2 plus billion people. Um, the Uyghur community is estimated anywhere between 16 and 24 million. And so you're thinking, well, mathematically, that's not a very large community. Geographically, it does have a rather large place. We have nuclear testing at Lop Nor. Uh, we have energy rafts that are coming from Central Asia through Xinjiang. It is a strategically important part of their country. And yes, there are communities in there that would like to see greater independence, or at least greater autonomy. Uh, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement is probably the most prominent of these organizations and is now currently listed as a terrorist organization by both the Chinese and the US government. And it's these Uyghur separatists that are vexing the Chinese as they try to engage farther east. But there are other issues at play. And I would put these as the security concerns. And two things that, that you sort of need to remember. One is their national military strategy outlines how China is rethinking itself as the way from being a Pacific power to being a continental power. Again, we always think of US-China relations, you know, our pivot to Asia in terms of China as a Pacific nation, China related to Japan, to Taiwan, obviously, the Korean Peninsula, et cetera. But increasingly, we have to think of China as a continental power. It is an Asian power looking southward to India, southwest to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and obviously eastward into Central Asia. And so when we think in terms of their engagement, anything from energy transfers to uh, economic trade control, uh, they're increasingly looking westward and increasingly seeing this as a security concern, specifically um, outside powers. Uh, and, and the phrase that I love, and it, and it really is, it, the Chinese are masters at, at getting that right specific phrasing, uh, the presence of non-hemispheric powers. Now you have to pause for a moment. What is a non-hemispheric power? They're in the Eastern Hemisphere. So automatically it's any major country in the Western Hemisphere that threatens stability and security in Asia. Now maybe that's Chile, probably not. Uh, you know, Trinidad, Tobago, I'm not guessing. Uh, maybe Canada, okay, they do well in hockey. Um, <laughs> It might just be the United States, right? They never mention us by name, and that's both a good and a bad thing. They don't give us the respect of saying, we don't like that the Americans are there, but they clearly have a concern uh, presence. And this map here, and this is a, a, a Chinese, uh, from a Chinese presentation, um, they uh, look at both Russian and, and American bases in the region, a little exaggerated because our base in Harshi Kanabak closed in 2005, and our presence in Dushanbe is, is not existing now. The French ran it for a while. Uh, but uh, you know, the Russians actually are there. That's our base at Manas. But uh, they, they do view this as a concern. It's part of encirclement, part of this broader uh, uh, this strategic concern. Uh, now, their solution is when we look at Afghanistan, we think in terms of uh, uh, other external organizations, and the Chinese most often propose the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a structure that can help this, you know, help move it forward. Uh, and you see from this map, it prides itself on being one of the geographically <coughs> largest organizations. It helps that you have Russia and China as members. Um, you have four of the five Central Asian states as full members, and these are our countries in green. In blue, we have our, you know, uh, our observer members, Mongolia, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran. Uh, some discussion of having them as full members, believe it or not, there is no protocol for membership. It's basically you join, you get accepted or not. And then you have the countries with special relationships, Belarus, Turkey, and Sri Lanka. Um, I have to figure out what the special relationship is. The US actually tried to be an observer and we were rejected, which is kind of disappointing. Um, and, and, and I would have liked us to, to be part of it because it's the one organization where English is not a language uh, used. It's actually Russian and Chinese. So we actually would have to go with interpreters or find Americans who speak Russian and Chinese to participate. 
Um, but I highlight this as one solution because all of these organizations, all of these countries I'm raising, and, and uh, what I'll do is I'll actually stop here and, and, and open up really for questions and discussion, um, is a host of different views, a host of competing views. And, and if we think in terms of how the Central Asian states, uh, sorry, how you know, Central Asian states, how Iran, how Pakistan, how China, how Russia view Afghanistan, our 2014 seems pretty straightforward. For them, it's a great mystery. They don't really have a lot of control of what's going on. And so what we'll see in the region and what we continue to see is, is a lot of concern. Um, their worst case scenario, scenario being a lot of the analysis, uh-oh, it's gonna get bad, it's gonna be problematic. And at the same time, they do see some of the potentials for trade and development. Now, of course, the challenge for us in this room, but also uh, any in the international community is what roles could we continue to play? Could the U.S. still be a balancer? Could the U.S. have a role? Uh, even if our military forces leave, could we still be a uh, force of civilian engagement, of humanitarian engagement, a role model, political advice, you name it? Uh, what sorts of roles can or could we play in this environment that's quickly shifting? Um, but as I said, there are some other things I could bring up, but I'd really like to, to pause at this moment and, and open it up for questions, discussions, and, 